So during the first talk, I'll talk about uh, the Bayesian neural networks. So we are on a deep bias uh, summer school, so finally it is time to talk about Bayesian neural networks. Uh, on this lecture, I'll tell you so what Bayesian neural networks are, uh, what are the be benefits of going Bayesian in deep learning, uh, how to train this Bayesian neural network stuff, and finally I'll finish with one a uh, specific example of Bayesian neural networks, sparse variational dropout, which you will implement yourself at the seminar that will follow the lecture. All right, so what you already know, what you will need uh, during this lecture, so of course it is stochastic optimization, which is now commonplace in all machine learning models. Uh, you know the basics of Bayesian modeling. You know about latent variable models, like variational autoencoders. And you know how to train these models using a variational inference. So variational inference is a technique that casts uh, the intractable Bayesian inference problem as a simple tractable stochastic optimization problem. And finally, uh, you know about this reparameterization trick, which allows to easily obtain uh, gradient estimators for the variational inference objectives. And using these building blocks, we will build Bayesian neural networks. So let me start uh, from ensemble learning. Uh, ensemble learning was commonplace since the beginning of machine learning. Uh, before the deep learning revolution, uh, the main uh, ensemble learning techniques were techniques like boosting and begging and staking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but after the deep learning revolution, uh, it became somewhat different. So one of the most common ways to learn an ensemble of neural network is just to take a bunch of uh, different initializations, several initial guesses, and just learn independent mod models from them. This is called deep ensembles, and this is like the most straightforward way to obtain an ensemble of neural networks. Uh, this technique is very simple but it provides you with like, the best possible quality of prediction. It is very hard to beat this baseline. However, it is very difficult uh, with respect to computational resources. Like you need, in order to obtain 10 neural networks, well, you need to train 10 neural networks separately. This is like 10 times more time. In order to uh, speed things up a little bit, there are several other things. So one example is snapshot-based methods. And one example you have seen yesterday. So this is a Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, so stochastic gradient Markov chain Monte Carlo, which you, of course, can apply to straightforwardly to neural networks and obtain uh, a set of snapshots just during one training time. So snapshot-based methods take one training procedure and then um, allow you to save several snapshots and thus obtain an ensemble. So there is also another more simple technique called snapshot ensembles, which is basically plain SGD, but with a specific cyclic learning rate, such that uh, the learning rate goes to very high values every like 50 epochs and then starts decaying again. And after uh, 50 epochs, you collect another snapshot. So these are techniques that allow you to obtain the whole ensemble using one training procedure. And in this talk, I will focus on uh, the third way uh, called stochastic neural networks or stochastic computation graphs. So this uh, allows us to not only pack a bunch of models into a single training procedure, but it also allows us to pack these models into just one computation graph. So you don't need to store several copies of your neural network. And there are a lot of different techniques. Basically, any technique that uses stochasticity inside your computational graph, like data augmentation, dropout, batch normalization, et cetera, et cetera, everything can be considered a stochastic neural network. So uh, let's talk a little bit about stochastic neural networks. So in usual deterministic neural networks, you have your uh, neural network F, which is a function of uh, object X and uh, weights W. And it outputs the uh, predictive distribution, P of T, given X and W. So T are the targets, for example, the class labels or the output in regression. And the neural network F models uh, the distribution or 
a point estimate of these outputs. Uh, stochastic neural network, on the, other on the other hand, is a function f that depends on x, uh, w, and epsilon. And epsilon is some kind of random noise, for example, dropout masks. And then to obtain the predictive distribution, p of t given x and w, you need to marginalize out the noise epsilon. So you need to take the expectation over this noise. And so if you have, for example, dropout, you need to average across different dropout masks to obtain like, the true predictive distribution. And such neural networks usually trained uh, using expected, by maximizing the expected log likelihood. So you have, you take a sample of, for example, the dropout masks, you plug it into your network, uh, and then you take a mini batch of data x, uh, compute your loss function, it can be like L2 loss for regression or your, your cross-entropy for classification, and then you optimize this loss. And in order to predict, so in the best case scenario, you would need to average across different masks. This is, of course, very inefficient. So there is this weight scaling rule heuristic where you take noise epsilon and substitute it with this expected value. So for example, in dropout, you take, during training, you use your dropout masks and during testing, when you like, write model.eval, uh, instead of the dropout masks, you take the expected value, so the dropout probability p. All right, uh, now in this stuff, let's move to uh, Bayesian neural networks. So let me remind you what a Bayesian discriminative model is. So in Bayesian discriminative modeling, you have your object x, you have your targets t, uh, yes. Yes, base scaling rule. Uh, so th this is uh, like this heuristic uh, inference technique where you take the during test time, you can take your stochasticity inside your network and substitute it with uh, the expected value of the stochasticity. Like in dropout, it is the dropout probability. Uh, in batch norm, it is the moving average statistics, etc. Yeah. So you have these uh, objects x, you have your targets t, and you have the weights of a neural network w. And the neural network defines this likelihood function, p of t given x and w, which, well, basically, like this p of t can be, for example, the softmax output. And then you have your pri the prior distribution p of w, and together, the likelihood function and the prior distribution define the probabilistic model of Bayesian neural network, if the likelihood is defined as a neural network. So then you would need to obtain the posterior distribution. This is, of course, intractable, as always. So there are different ways to approximate it. Uh, if you uh, use Markov chain Monte Carlo technique, you obtain a set of snapshots and approximate your posterior distribution as a mixture of delta functions. And if you use variational inference, well, as, we, as we will see, you will obtain a stochastic neural network that will approximate the posterior distribution. So what are the differences between discriminative models and generative models? Like in most of the previous talks, you dealt with generative models like variational autoencoders. So in Bayesian neural networks, there are no local latent variables. So in variational autoencoders for each object x, y, you had uh, the corresponding latent code ZY, so there is no such stuff here. There are only global latent variables W, which are common for all objects. And the second difference is that uh, Bayesian neural network has much, much higher dimensionality of the latent variables. So when in variational autoencoders you use like a hundred or a thousand um, dimensional space to model your latent codes, uh, in neural network, you have millions, or even billions of parameters, and all of them you have to model in a Bayesian way, so that your posterior now has like a billion dimensions. So we have to deal with that somehow. So let's assume for now that we know how to obtain this posterior distribution or have a good way to approximate it. Now, what can we do uh, if we obtained it? So why, why should we go Bayesian? Well, it turns out that there are a lot of uh, different applications. 
So first of all, let's see how we should obtain the prediction for the trained Bayesian model. So um, once you obtain the posterior distribution, you need to, you then, during test time, you uh, get your new object X star, and you need to find the target T star, or the, the distribution over the target T star. Uh, how to do it? Well, you just write the probability of T star given X star and everything else that we already know, like the training set, and we don't know the weights, so we can't condition the weights because weights are now random variables, so we don't know their value. So we just write this stuff, and it turns out that we can rewrite it as uh, an integral. So we need to marginalize the weights. We can rewrite it as an integral of this likelihood function P of T star given X star and W, and the posterior distribution. Uh, so what it means is that in order to make predictions for new object X star, you need to average the predictions P of T star given X star and W over the posterior distribution P of W given the training data. Uh, you can, so you can, if you can sample from your posterior distribution, you can use Monte Carlo estimation to estimate this expectation. Uh, so you just draw several samples from the posterior distribution, WK, and then plug WK into your neural network, pass your object X star, and obtain the predictions T star. So if you would implement it, uh, for example, for classification, if your likelihood is like so, uh, softmax, so if your neural network uh, provides a softmax output, you would need to average the softmax outputs of a neural network, like not the logits, but the softmax, because you have the probability here, not the log probability. And as we know, ensembles, so yeah, uh, this means that once we obtain the posterior distribution, we actually now have an infinitely large ensemble of neural networks all in one model. So one sample from the posterior is equal to one element of the ensemble. And as we know from ensemble learning, ensembles provide high accuracy and are more robust. Uh, so one of the most uh, commonly known applications of Bayesian neural networks is in sausage estimation. And uh, I think Andrei Malinin will tell you everything you need to know about uncertainty estimation during the next lecture. So I will just provide a brief overview. But uh, when the usual deterministic neural network provides you a point estimate of the output, Bayesian neural network allowed you to obtain a distribution over the outputs. Like you sample different weights, uh, you obtain different predictions, so you now have a distribution over the predictions. And you can actually use this distribution in a lot of uh, cool ways. For example, you can use it for, to detect adversarial attacks or out-of-domain data or corrupted data. You can use it to reject classification if your network is not sure about your prediction. You can use it uh, for active learning, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, stay tuned for the next lecture. Another example where this can be useful is online or incremental learning. I think you uh, already saw this example during the first day. So assume that the data set arrives in independent parts, and you take the first part d1, you obtain the posterior distribution p of w given d1. Uh, and then when new data arrives, you actually don't need to train the neural network from scratch uh, once again, using datasets D1 and D2, you only need the datasets D2 to update your posterior. So to do that, you can use your posterior P of W given D1 as a new prior distribution. And then, as you can see, you can uh, rewrite it as using the Bayes theorem, like P of D1 given W, P of W, and this would altogether give you the posterior distribution of W given D21. So you only need to, uh, during the second phase of training where you add new data, you only need the new data. And you can do it uh, several times and in such sequential updates, obtain the full posterior distribution uh, given the full data. 
And this uh, technique can actually be uh, uh, generalized to other more uh, complex cases. Yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here are two papers uh, by Kirkpatrick et al. and Richard et al. Yeah, so... Well, uh, they use Laplace approximation, and Laplace approximation is actually uh, one way to perform approximate Bayesian inference. Yeah, so I will not uh, go into details during this talk, but like, I can tell you about Laplace approximation in, uh, like, after the lecture. So the basic idea of Laplace approximation is that you take your trained neural network and then uh, use the curvature information, like the Hessian or the empirical feature information matrix, to uh, fit a Gaussian distribution inside your loss function, and then use this Gaussian distribution as a posterior approximation. OK, so this can, actually, this can be generalized to cases like multitask learning and federated learning, so this stuff is, can be quite useful. Another curious application is the quantization. Uh, so it turns out that if you have your, if you obtain the procedure distribution, you can use it to automatically determine the necessary bit precision for the base of a neural network. So uh, you can look at the procedure distribution, like this red line over here, and then uh, compare the uh, posterior density for different uh, weight precisions. Like for, for, there are a lot of points uh, in float 32. And for example, this is, oh, sorry, this is, mm, this is the best fit for float 32. And this is the best fit for float 8. And as you can see, the posterior probability for both these points is the same. So it, it, it means that you can switch to float 8 and use float 8 for predictions. And the cool thing about this is that you can, you can automatically determine the bit precision for each layer separately. For example, like the first layer can be a float 8, the second layer can be float 4, etc. cetera, uh, which is, uh, I don't think that this is easily possible if you don't have a distribution over the parameters. And here you get it out of the box. All right, so how do you train your Bayesian neural network? So we do the same thing as we did with variational autoencoders. So we want to obtain, to approximate the posterior distribution, the, which is very complex. So we approximate it with a simple uh, parametric distribution Q phi of W. Uh, and we do it by minimizing the Kolbeck label divergence between Q of W and the posterior distribution P of W given the training data. Uh, just like in variational autoencoders, we can write down the variational lower bound, and it looks very should look very familiar. So you have the expected log likelihood term, you have the Kolbeck label divergence term. Um, and the first term is just basically your conventional loss function, you would train any stochastic neural network using this first term. So you take the sample of the weights from the uh, approximate posterior Q, you plug it in, you take mini batches of data and compute the loss function. And the second term is a regularization term that only depends on the variational parameters phi. And it can be implemented as a regularizer. So if you compare it to the elbow or operational autoencoders, uh, one, there are two main differences. So the first is that because there are no local latent variables, and there are only global latent variables, we have the global uh, KL term. So there is only one KL term here, and there are n KL, different KL terms for operational autoencoders. And we have an extremely high dimensional posterior, so instead of sampling from some like thousand dimensional distribution, we have to sample from a billion dimensional distribution. So you can uh, perform the reparameterization trick 
for Bayesian neural networks are just the same way. So you reparameterize your W given phi. Uh, how do you do it? You find this function g uh, that depends on variational parameters phi and some non-parametric noise epsilon, so that comes from some fixed distribution p of epsilon. <laughs> and this function g uh, should provide you with samples from the variational distribution q of W given phi. And then you can substitute the expectation uh, over the weights W with expectation over uh, the noise epsilon and obtain this new, this new expression for the evidence lower bound where you sample the noise epsilon and then plug epsilon to the function G, plug the output of the function G into the weights of your neural network and then calculate the loss function. And this allows uh, to obtain an unbiased differentiable mini batch estimator. So you can use a mini batching, uh, like x, m, and t, m. Uh, you can take one sample epsilon from distribution p of epsilon, plug it into your network, obtain, obtain the weights w, plug them into your network, and uh, push the mini batch x, m through the neural network, obtain the outputs, compute the loss function, uh, rescale this loss function so that we don't break the balance between the uh, data term and the KL term, and that's it. You can plug it into your uh, favorite, favorite automatic differentiation toolkit and obtain the gradients. And usually just one sample per iteration is enough, so the Complexity is just the same as for any stochastic neural network, like dropout. And actually, dropout is perhaps the simplest, uh, the simplest example of a Bayesian neural network. So let's revisit dropout. You have uh, these dropout masks, which you multiply by your neurons. Uh, it is the same as multiplying the dropout masks by your weights when each row gets deleted. So you can rewrite it as, like if you have one layer with uh, weight matrix W and you have these parameters phi that are actually your trainable weights, you can multiply them by this diagonal matrix epsilon, uh, where epsilon comes from Bernoulli distribution and you would obtain basically the same thing as dropout does. So the, uh, the rows or the columns of the matrix W will be zeroed out. And it can be shown that uh, if you consider, for example, Gaussian prior, this would just uh, lead to L2 regularization. So the KL dividends between like, this approximate posterior, which is quite strange, but you can still use it as an approximate posterior, and the prior distribution would be just L2 regularization. And when you combine dropout, binary dropout and L2 regularization, well, you obtain the simplest possible Bayesian neural network. So this means that dropout has other uses beyond just plain regularization. So you can use, yes? Where is uh, where, what? Yeah, 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 so uh, lambda is, um, can be derived from the variance of the Gaussian prior. And here it would act as a regularization coefficient that you can like, choose somehow. So we will talk about how we can choose it later. So yeah, using binary dropout means being Bayesian, and it means that there are several extensions. So first of all, uh, in the best case scenario, you need to perform test time averaging or assembling for dropout. Secondly, uh, you can use dropout for uncertainty estimation and it performs quite well. And finally, it means that we can extend binary dropout using like, different techniques like reinforce or gamble trick uh, in order to tune the dropout to HP. And there are some papers on that, for example, like concrete dropout paper, which can allows you to tune the dropout rate probability for each layer or for each neuron or even for each weight. Uh, another example is a fully factorized Gaussian posterior approximation. So this is like the most common uh, Bayesian neural network. So 
the approximate posterior is a fully factorized Gaussian distribution. So there's each wage, wi, has its own uh, expected value, mu i, and its own variance sigma i squared. So this distribution is easily reparameterizable, just like in variational outer encoders, you take your expected value, you take your uh, standard deviation and some uh, standard Gaussian noise, you multiply the noise by the standard deviation, you add the uh, mean, and that's it, you obtain the sample from the Gaussian distribution. And you can plug it into your neural network, so yeah, here you have the data term, uh, you have the expectation of a epsilon, your weights are now uh, reparameterized like this, and you have the scale divergence, which is basically the scale divergence between two Gaussian distribution. It does not matter how this looks for now, but you can uh, just implement it as a some function or uh, that depends on mu and sigma, and that's it. And so this is more tractable than binary dropout approximation because you don't need tricks like reinforce or gamble trick. Uh, it provides a rich approximation. Uh, however, it has mm, like twice as many parameters. So yeah, uh, there is some trade-off. And well, a typical uh, advice on how to train this, you start with some small sigma and you optimize with respect to log sigma in order to avoid constraint optimization. So basically just like with variational autoencoders. So do you have any questions? Like this is the key slide. So this is uh, like the most common Bayesian neural network that you will find. And everything else just builds upon this. All right, great. So it turns out that um, there are some problems with this. So uh, let's look uh, on the data term, on how we estimate the data term. So here, uh, if we, uh, let me return yeah, to this slide. So when we uh, do mini-batching uh, and reparameterization trick, we have the same value, we have the same value of W for every object inside the mini-batch, right? Because like we can't, uh, we can't uh, sample uh, separate weights for each object inside the mini-batch. The mini-batching would not work. And this can lead to a problem. Like, so this is the mini batch estimator of the data term. Like li is your loss function, and it depends on phi, on phi and epsilon. And you can try to calculate the variance of uh, this estimator. So uh, you have n squared over m squared, and you have the variance of the sum, which is basically the sum of the variances plus the sum of the covariances. And uh, as all uh, as all uh, summons are equally distributed, they have the same variance and the same covariances. So you have um, this variance li here. So we uh, put one over m squared inside the brackets. And you have one over m times the variance plus m minus one over m times the covariance. Like there is this quadratic number of covariances here. And what it means is that as the mini batch gets larger, uh, the variance diminishes, but the covariances do not. Like they remain constant. And it means that you will obtain, uh, you can obtain a very high variance estimator, even if you perform the reparameterization trick. So there is a way to uh, avoid this called the local reparameterization trick. So consider a simple linear layer with weight matrix W, input A and output B. So yeah, so B is equal A times W. And if the weight matrix W ca uh, comes from the, this Gaussian distribution, the prediction would have high correlation and therefore uh, the variance of the stochastic gradient would also be high. Because like, there is only one weight sample per batch and for all objects the weights are the same. However, uh, now that the activation A, uh, the input A is fixed, and the weight matrix W comes from a Gaussian distribution. Well, B is just a linear combination of Gaussian general variables. This means that B also comes from a Gaussian distribution. So we can write the distribution over B. 
and B comes from this Gaussian distribution A with expected value A times mu and variance A squared times sigma squared. So uh, pardon the abuse of notation. Here, these green operations, like the square and uh, square root, are element-wise. So you have a matrix, and you square each element. So in order to sample from this distribution, you just obtain the standard deviations, you obtain the means, and, well, you obtain the matrix, the sample B. And what it essentially does, uh, it virtually samples one weight sample per object, because like now the each for each object the predictions are not correlated, like they're independent. Uh, so this drastically lowers the variance. And in order to implement it, well, you have this forward pass for the means, and you actually have the same forward pass for the variances. You just square your inputs, you take squared variances, you use the same function for the forward pass as you would use for the mean, and then you take the square root. So the complexity is twice uh, the complexity of the simple forward pass, but so we pay twice the computational resources, but we obtain much better gradients. Do you have like, any questions? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, here uh, in this matrix B, all so each row of matrix B corresponds to one object, right? And because this weight matrix W is like the same for all rows of matrix A, uh, the rows of matrix B are correlated. Right? And here, the rows of matrix B are not correlated, they're independent. Yeah, so that's why uh, like the objects do not correlate with each other. Like here? Here. Here. So yeah, so the problem was that um, we have this shared noise sample. So uh, when we calculate the variance of the estimator, you have this covariance term. So the predictions for different objects are correlated, and this contributes to the variance of the estimator. And this contribution is actually very large. And if we decorrelate the predictions, like the simplest way to avoid this would be to sample one weight matrix per object, but this is, of course, very expensive. You would need to perform a separate forward pass for each object. Uh, but you can do it much easier if you just uh, calculate the distribution of uh, the matrix B and then sample from this distribution. All right, so this is called the local representation trick, and, well, basically it is pretty hard to train a Bayesian neural network without it. It turns out that the local representation trick also reduces the variances, not only for the mini batch, but for even for one object, but it is not very straightforward. So I can try to provide you with some intuition, but it is okay if you don't understand it, because like the derivation is not trivial, it takes like about a page or so. So if you consider the gradient of the loss function uh, with respect to some variance, uh, the standard deviation like sigma i, this can be decomposed by the chain rule as the gradient uh, with respect to the output b and the gradient with respect to output b o by and the gradient of b uh, with respect to sigma i. And well, this can be calculated like this. So for each uh, for each standard standard deviation parameter for each sigma i, we have a separate sample epsilon i. So this is for representation trick. For the local representation trick, you have one common sample for each variance. And it turns out that these different samples result in a lot of redundant stochasticity. So basically, uh, one value of uh, the activation b can correspond to a lot of different values of 
gradients with respect to sigma. And if you perform the local reparameterization trick, the value of B, uh, one sample of B, uh, completely defines the gradient with respect to sigma. So uh, in the reparameterization trick, this also adds, this also adds even more variance. And the local reparameterization trick moves it, in, moves it even lower. Yeah, but like, yeah, this is very not straightforward. Yeah, so what about convolutions? Well, we can no longer apply the local reparameterization trick for convolutions because uh, their different uh, spatial locations are no longer independent. Like you have the same uh, convolutional kernel that is applied to different locations. So therefore different spatial positions are correlated and you have to uh, you have to use this correlation in order to uh, perform exact local reparameterization. However, you can uh, use the mean field approximation and assume that they are not correlated. Well, this is, of course, not justified. This changes the loss function, but this performs much better than just plain reparameterization. And well, maybe there is some way to justify it, but we just don't know it yet. It is still a stochastic neural network after all, just a little bit different one. And so what you can do for convolutions, like you have this star convolutional operator, and you can do the same thing. You calculate the means and the variances using two forward passes, and then you just sample the activations in exactly the same way as for the linear, as for the linear layer. Okay, so I think this is a good time to take a break. So yeah, so don't worry if you didn't get the local representation trick completely. You will implement it during the seminar and hopefully it would be much clearer. So this is actually very easy to implement. Okay, so what next? So next I'll talk a little bit about some technical details uh, about how to train Bayesian neural networks. So first of all, uh, before, we were mo mostly talking about the weight matrices of neural networks. Uh, and neural networks have a lot of different other parameters, not only the weights, but like the biases, the uh, linear transformation, and batch normalization, et cetera, et cetera. They, these parameters are not very expressive, but they're still here, so we need to, to do something about them. So one way, of course, is to put prior distributions over these parameters and perform variational inference for them as well. But uh, this makes the implementation more bulky and there is actually not too much sense in doing this. So you can just treat them as deterministic parameters. So one way to justify it is to say that, well, we assume a flat prior distribution, like uniform prior distribution and a delta peak posterior distribution uh, and perform like this pseudo variational inference where the approx approximate posterior distribution is actually, is actually just one point. Or you can see it as bounding the marginal log likelihood of the data given these parameters. So you have this log P of T given X and theta. Theta, for example, the biases of a neural network. And you can bound it using the evidence lower bound, which now depends on phi and theta. And, well, this is just the same evidence lower bound, but your likelihood function not only depends on W, but also depends on theta. And theta are just some deterministic parameters. So you don't need to change anything at all in your computational graph or in your loss function. So you can just plain plug it in and that's it. And this is closely, this, this trick is closely related to empirical base. Uh, so one important question is how to choose the prior distribution. And well, one way to choose the prior distribution is to learn the prior distribution. So you can parameterize your prior. So now that you have this P of W given theta, theta are now the parameters of the prior distribution, for example, like the variance. And then you still can compute, you can compute this marginal uh, log likelihood of T given X and theta. You can bound it 
using the evidence lower bound. Now you have this data charm, which is exactly the same as before, and you have this Kulbach labeler charm, uh, which now depends on phi and theta. And you maximize it with respect to phi and theta. So this technique can be used to tune your prior distribution, and this is called empirical base. Of course, this technique is a little bit questionable because uh, in theory you shouldn't uh, feed the prior distribution to the data, because it is like prior knowledge, you shouldn't extract it from the training data. But if the uh, parameters phi are not very expressive, for example, like one variance per layer, it is okay. So of course this may overfit if the dimension of theta is large, uh, because this is still just plain maximum likelihood training for theta. And in order to mitigate it, you can uh, assume another hyper prior over theta and perform variational inference over theta, but uh, then you would need to define the prior and learn this prior, etc. So there would be priors all the way down. Um, still, you can just use this one prior P of W and theta and th things should be okay. Uh, as we will see later, like you, will, you never know whether you can overfit with a particular parameterization of the prior distribution, so you should be careful. But yeah, you can take this procedure and apply it. And such technique is usually used to induce sparsity or quantization, so in works like the relevance vector machine uh, or uh, software sharing. All right, finally, uh, so previously we discussed that in order to um, uh, make predictions for Bayesian neural networks, you need to perform assembling, which is very expensive. You need, for each test object, you need to perform like, several forward passes. And sometimes uh, it is acceptable, sometimes it is not. When it is not acceptable, you can perform distillation. Uh, so what is distillation? Well, you probably might know distillation from just conventional deep learning. So you can take a large network or an ensemble or something like compli complicated like this, and then distill it into a student network. So, for example, if you perform Bayesian inference or you obtain some kind of ensemble using MCMC, using uh, variational inference, or using any other ensembling technique, you can uh, write the distillation loss function and train the student network to mimic this ensemble. So here you have the expectation over the, over the teacher network. Like if th this is a plain ensemble, this, is, this would be like the sum of all different models. You have this expectation. Uh, yeah, and this is just plain cross entropy between the output of the student network and the teacher network. So this is like a conventional loss function, but instead of hard labels, uh, like zero, one, one hot recordings, you have these soft labels, which are the soft max outputs of the teacher network. And the city, you can, tra you can train the student network in such a way and obtain some approximation to the uh, predicted distribution. Of course, this would perform worse than the whole ensemble, but it would be better than a, a single network. And this, of course, would be much faster than the whole ensemble. So one example of the paper is where this was introduced for Bayesian learning is the Bayesian technology by uh, Wellness Group. Okay, so uh, what are the main takeaways from these Bayesian neural networks? So basically, you can uh, reinterpret any stochastic neural network as some kind of variational inference procedure for Bayesian neural network. Uh, if you use Gaussian distributions or any other distribution that allows for local reparameterization trick, you should use it, it really helps a lot. And finally, in order to find the prior distribution, you can resort to empirical base. So there are a lot of other techniques to set variational inference to, to train, uh, to perform approximate Bayesian inference or related, or related stuff. So of course there is Markov chain Monte Carlo, there is this Laplace approximation, which I already mentioned, where you use the curvature information in order to obtain the posterior approximation. There is uh, Stein variational gradient descent, uh, which is 
um, a pretty complicated procedure which allows you to optimize a set of particles not independently, like in deep ensembles, but altogether, and then obtain a better fit uh, to the posterior distribution using a mixture of delta functions. And of course, there are other uh, techniques that are the ways to train stochastic neural networks or related uh, things like variational information bottleneck, uh, deep Gaussian processes, and stuff like that. So the list goes on and on and on. So now, uh, let me tell you about sparse variational dropout, which you will implement during the seminar. So uh, let's start with uh, plain dropout. So when the dropout was introduced, it was introduced like in two uh, special cases. One was binary dropout, where you multiply, multiply the activations by uh, the Bernoulli random variables. There was also Gaussian dropout, where you multiply the activations by the uh, Gaussian noise with expected value one and variance alpha. Uh, this can be, uh, um, so, and there are also other modifications like drop connect, where instead of multiplicating the activations by the noise, you multiply the weights by the noise, which is, does basically the same thing and performs just as well. Uh, so let's consider this Gaussian drop connect, where you take the weights and multiply them by this Gaussian noise and yeah, so this Gaussian noise does not change the mean value. It has some multiplicative noise. And what this means is that the weight now comes from this Gaussian distribution with a little bit strange parameterization. You have the means W hat and the variance alpha times W hat squared, right? Uh, and you should already like recognize some sort of variational inference inside this method. So, uh, in order to completely define uh, variational inference, you need to uh, come up with a probabilistic model. So, the likelihood function is basically, in the posterior approximation are already defined. So, this is just the same neural network as always, and this is this Gaussian approximation. So, you need to come up with um, some prior distribution such that this term goes away. So in plain dropout, you don't have any regularization term, right? So you need, so in order to fully justify Gaussian dropout, you need to come up with a prior distribution such, such that the, this regularization term does not depend on the weights. And it turns out that there is only one way to do it. So this is the so-called log uniform distribution. And as a homework, you can try to compute the KL divergence between the, this Gaussian approximation and the um, log uniform distribution. And you can see that this is just a function of this dropout rate alpha. It does not depend on the weights. And this is like the only prior distribution that has this uh, property. You can actually prove it. So this is a very strange prior distribution. It is non-normalizable. It is an improper prior. Uh, however, it is still uh, used in some machine learning models and it is still quite useful. So now that we have this regularization term that only depends on alpha, we uh, have a full like, Bayesian justification of this Gaussian dropout procedure and also we can tune uh, the dropout rates so, uh, because this is just a, another variational parameter, not a hyperparameter anymore. Okay, so if you try to do it, uh, you can, so you can write this reparameterization for the ways W, W is equal to W hat times this Gaussian noise with mean one and variance alpha times W squared. And if you try to compute uh, the gradient, it would be very noisy. Like the, you just take this gradient of W, uh, so W is a random variable and W hat is actually the mean parameter. Uh, and if you take the gradient of W over W hat, you obtain this noise. And well, if alpha is large, this gradient is very, very noisy. 
just like this, each sign would be random if alpha is sufficiently large. So uh, Kingma et al, they found that uh, alpha goes to large values and that it corresponds to some kind of uh, strange local optima, uh, which is hard to escape from. So uh, what is the solution? Just restrict the alpha so that it lies from zero to one. And this way they restricted the flexibility of the posterior approximation. And it worked quite well for them. Uh, however, it turns out that we might actually need very large alphas. So let's take a look at the objective once again. So this is this kullback label division term, uh, which you want, like, like minus KL, which you want to, min to maximize. And this KL term is not uh, tractable, so you need to come up with some kind of approximation, but it can be approximated very well, which is just a technical detail, which is not very important. And uh, as you can see, this KL term uh, increases in log alpha, increases in alpha, so it pushes alpha to infinity. Uh, and what does large alpha mean? Well, large alpha mean, means that you have this infinitely large noise that would corrupt the data term unless the weight goes to zero. And if alpha goes to infinity and the weight goes to zero faster than alpha, then uh, the approximate posterior for this weight would collapse to a delta peak at zero. And then this weight would be removed from the model. So alpha goes to infinity and the weight gets removed. Basically you obtain sparsity. And so, uh, this technique might be very useful to, for, for example, neural network compression to obtain, for sp obtaining sparse solutions. And uh, there is this some sort of equivalence between Gaussian dropout and binary dropout, which can be derived using the central limit theorem. It is a little bit hand wavy, but well, we can do it. And so you can use it to write down the correspondence between the uh, binary dropout probability pi P and, and the Gaussian dropout rate alpha. And you obtain this expression, and when alpha goes to infinity, the dropout rate goes to one, it means that the weight is removed like always. So yeah, this results in sparsity. Okay, but we still have this problem that when alpha is large, you have very noisy gradients. Uh, so Kim et al. tried to uh, clip the alphas to low values, but it turns out that there is a very elegant solution. Like you just need to use a different parameterization. Like instead of this multiplicative parameterization, you, you, you can use the simple uh, conventional uh, additive parameterization. And if you compute the uh, gradient of um, W over W hat, there should be hat here, uh, you obtain one. Here you obtained one plus uh, alpha epsilon, and here you obtain one, and here is no noise. Like, this is some magic stuff, which allows you to reduce the noise uh, very, very much. Okay, so instead of optimizing with respect to W, yes? Yeah, 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 because like, the objective is still the same. Just, you can now just rewrite alpha as a function of mu and epsilon, or as a function of mu and sigma, yeah? So you can define this uh, Gaussian distribution using this W and sigma, or you can define it using W and alpha, and these parameterizations are equivalent. You can rewrite sigma as a function of alpha and W, or you can rewrite alpha as a function of W and sigma. This is exactly the same. But because of this multiplication, like your weights are multiplied by the noise, and here the noise is actually added. So when you take the derivatives, uh, if the noise is multiplied, well, the gradient is noisy. If the noise is added, the gradient is not noisy. And if you do it, some magic stuff happens, and uh, the network becomes really, really sparse. So here you can see a small neural network. So this is a linear five for MNIST, and these are the uh, examples from the convolutional layer and a, a, a patch from a fully connected layer. 
And you can see that in initialization it is very dense, and by the end it is very, very sparse. So it is possible to like, uh, sparsify small networks, like fully connected uh, networks on NIST and convolutional layer networks on MNIST, like 70 or like almost 300 times. So this is a very, very simple network, which is uh, somehow a common baseline for network compression, which is rather strange. There are already very small networks on MNIST, but people used to compare compression on these networks. So we also tried it on larger networks like VGG-like on Cypher 10 and Cypher 100, still obtain uh, like 20 to 70 times compression depending on the network size with no accuracy degradation. And some other uh, guys from Google uh, scaled it up to ImageNet and transformer networks and well, uh, obtained uh, sparse ResNets, for example, ResNet 50 on ImageNet. Okay, so um, this is another uh, funny property of sparse operational dropout. So there was this uh, paper called Understanding Deep Learning Requires Rethinking Generalization, where they took a neural network and uh, changed it not on the correct data, but on corrupted data where the labels, all the labels are permuted. Like this plane is now a dog, this car is now a truck, this bird is now a deer, etc. And the network achieves 100% classification accuracy on the training set. And on the testing set, of course, uh, it provides random guess quality predictions because there is no uh, dependence between the input and the output. But the strange thing is that you can take a neural network and fit it to any kind of crappy data and uh, still you would obtain like very good uh, training curve, very good training performance, but uh, you will not know what happens inside. So if you try to do it with sparse variational dropout, it actually uh, removes each single weight and results in a 100% uh, sparse neural network which provides you a constant prediction. So that both the ac training accuracy and the testing accuracy is the same and is like, random guess quality, but there is no generalization gap here, so it does not have a feature on this random labeling data. Yeah, so this is just a funny property. Yes? Yes. Well, uh, you can take a neural network with zero weights. Yeah, it's like every weight is zero, and then you take this object, you multiply it by a zero matrix, you obtain activation zero, so the output of the whole network would be zero, and the soft marks like of zero would be a uniform distribution, and this is like random guess quality prediction. Yeah. And there are also uh, different extensions of sparse variational dropout, so one of them is recurrent neural networks, so uh, recurrent neural networks require some uh, sort of other tricks in order to apply variational inference because you can't perform, for example, local reparameterization trick straightforwardly, and you should be careful about performing plane reparameterization trick because like, there is a dependency across time, so you have to uh, take this in mind. Uh, so another extension is going from general sparsity to structure sparsity. So of course, general sparsity is cool. You can compress your neural network in a like, sparse format, but it is not very useful because you will still need to unpack it in order to make predictions. Uh, and if you, for example, uh, remove the whole neurons or convolutional filters, you would just make the model smaller and the predictions would be faster. So one way to do it with a technique similar to variational dropout is instead of uh, multiplying like, the weights by some multiplicative noise, you can multiply the neurons by this noise and then uh, put the log uniform distribution over this multiplicative mask Z and perform variational inference over Z, treating W as deterministic parameters and you would attain structure sparsity. 
Yeah. Uh, so uh, there is also um, another extension for quantization. So you can, uh, instead of just using sim simple uh, log uniform prior, you can take actually a mixture of log uniform priors, for example, the center zero and with uh, two other points like C and minus C. And then you can train this C constant using um, empirical base. And then uh, your approximate posterior would converge to either to a delta peaks at either zero, C, or minus C. So you would obtain basically a, a ternary network. So which would be very efficient to store and to apply. I think you can uh, do binary networks like this as well. And there are also variance networks, which I will talk about later. So yeah, I think that's uh, all for now. So let me know if you have any questions. Yes. Uh, do we have a microphone? I understand that right that variational dropout is basically something like uh, Bayesian neural networks, but without, uh, but with other KL divergence term and without uh, learning um, biases in weights. I mean. Uh, mean values. Like, uh, so variational dropout is just, is just a variational in inference technique. So there is some kind of KL dividends term, which is, which is like this one. And uh, there is this data term, which is like exactly the same as with all other uh, variational inference methods. So this is, the so variational dropout is just a uh, Bayesian neural network which is trained by variational inference with a fully factorized Gaussian posterior approximation where you train both the means and the variances. And you have this uh, KL dividends term between the, Ga the Gaussian distribution and the log uniform distribution. So, but, but uh, when you um, not multiply weight uh, uh, but uh, use additive, uh, um, how you... Um, uh, here? Yes. Yes. So it looks basically like a uh, usual Bayesian neural network. Yeah, right. It is a usual Bayesian neural network. And uh, so uh, uh, the variational dropout here is just, so that, m that makes it to specify is just another uh, uh, loss function uh, with another prior for weights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically what makes the solution sparse is this uh, prior distribution which has which has this huge peak at zero. So yeah, you take this prior distribution and you obtain a very sparse solution. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I wanted to ask regarding the um, rethinking generalization thing and the 100% sparsity. So is there an explanation for this? Why this happens? So there is this like, hand wave explanation. Uh, there, is, like, there, there is no uh, dependence between the training data and the testing data. So you need a lot of capacity of the network in order to make up these dependencies. And if you have need a lot of capacity, this scale dividends term would be very, very high because you cannot like, compress this network just as, like, as well. And it turns out that this scale dividends term overpowers the data term in this case and decides to completely sparsify the whole network. Okay, thanks. Yes. So uh, I have a question. So here, in the, the results that you have here are for MNIST, R on MNIST, and CIFAR 10, both of which are pretty, uh, here? yeah, these. Um, so, so they're pretty simple data sets and they're with only 10 classes. So how does this scale for larger dimensional images and more classes? And also how, does, how well does this work for say regression tasks? Are there any other complications with that? So um, we tried this only for like, Instance of a 10 because like, at that time we didn't have the computational resources 
uh, to go to ImageNet. Uh, there is a paper from uh, Google, I'm not sure, I think it is Google Brain, uh, that uh, scales it up to ImageNet and resonated ImageNet and I think some transformer network for uh, translation or language modeling, I'm not quite sure, but yeah, they did uh, scale it up to larger networks as well. So it somehow works, I think. Question there. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I wanted to ask whether uh, the variation on dropout framework is applicable to uh, sparsifying networks, not in terms of uh, only sparsity, but in terms of weight topology, because uh, some uh, methods that uh, uh, do uh, weight specification, they mainly focus not on uh, obtaining a sparse matrix of weights, but obtaining a compressed matrix of weights. So is there any way to do that with Yeah, so, one? yeah, uh, one way to, uh, like, do, uh, to compress matrices to induce some kind of structure. So, for example, like, remove the whole rows or columns from the matrix, something like this. Another way is to do quantization. So yeah, I think these two are like the main extensions. So I'm not sure if, so I'm actually not sure what other stuff you can do in order to compress the matrix. Like you can try to do some uh, tensor or matrix decompositions, and this is like an orthogonal approach to specification. So you can combine specification and matrix or tensor decompositions. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this is a more general question. Uh, I know that um, ensembles with uh, um, some um, uh, priors uh, functions or something like that are still very strong baselines in this field. And uh, do you have any idea why, why we kind of still have this gap in performance between uh, uh, Bayesian neural networks with, with uh, stochastic variational inference and other ways of approximating a, uh, a posterior distribution. I mean, I, I know people have tried all, all sorts of uh, more complicated posteriors and stuff like this, mm -hmm. but <laughs> this gap still exists. Yeah, so. yeah, sure. Okay, so, well, there are several uh, common ways to approximate like the posterior distribution or train ensembles. So, of course, if you train like separate models, you would obtain the best possible results. Uh, and you resort to these snapshot-based methods and stochastic neural networks just because you cannot train the full ensemble. So uh, if you can learn an ensemble, of course you should learn an ensemble. I'm not sure so that uh, variational inference technique will be able to beat this baseline in the near future because you still try to pack a whole ensemble into just one computational model. And this is a very, very hard job. Um, okay, may I follow up? Mm -hmm. so, um, th but this is not actually a problem of capacity of the network, right? Well, a stochastic neural network, like if you uh, forget all this Bayesian stuff and just see it as a stochastic computation graph, it is still uh, some kind of model with limited capacity. So. If you just double the number of parameters, you add the means and the variances, you can still only fit so, mu so much into this, which is still quite limited. So I, there was like another uh, funny paper that uh, first trained uh, several snapshots using like MCMC and then tried to uh, approximate this posterior distribution using a generative adversarial network. Like you have this uh, GAN generator uh, which outputs you the base of neural networks, but um, still you, then you would need a much more powerful neural network in order to model like different neural networks. Yeah, so it might be easier to just train them from scratch separately. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for your talk. In slide for 14, please. 14? Yes. Oh, 14. Yeah, so here you're explaining like uh, using dropout during training means you're being uh, Bayesian, but yes. uh, I, I just wanted to confirm that in the 
paper they use like MC dropout during test time. So it's dropout at test time, which approximates to a variational uh, inference, and you're using like a Bayesian approach. So mm -hmm. out here, I'm I'm not sure they're speaking about dropout at train time, right? So, well, uh, in order to apply dropout at testing time, you need to also train with dropout. So, yeah, all, all works that use MC dropout during testing, they also use dropout during training. And if you use dropout using training, yeah, of course, you need to perform this uh, MC averaging during testing. Because, like, this is a principled way to approximate the posterior predictive distribution. So one way to do it, of course, is just this weight scaling rule, but this is a crude approximation. In order to do everything like the correct way, you have to sample, right, and apply MC dropout. And one more technical question on slide 30. 30. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, uh, yes. the uh, more reasonable question is uh, why not to do from the very beginning uh, the, mm, the way that is stated as after. Um, and it seems that uh, why we haven't uh, we done this uh, way of uh, uh, ver variating rates uh, from the very beginning is that uh, the way that used before guaranteed us some distribution, yeah, with that high mm -hmm. peak at zero. Um, the question is then, uh, do we really have the same distribution of weights uh, in the way that is stated as after? Yeah, so yeah, so these two parameterization, like they're completely equivalent. You can take this W and alpha, and you can take the W and sigma, and then, uh, perform like a bijective mapping between them. Yeah, so these two distributions are completely completely equivalent. Uh, yeah, it's just we are st uh, stating that in, before we were training alpha and now we are training sigma. Yes, uh -huh. okay. no, both like both W and sigma and before both mm -hmm. W and alpha, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you for the talk. I wanted to know if you have any comments around calibration of each of these approaches uh, or if you're aware of any work um, that, um, that puts some comments about calibration because um, uh, there are some comments about errors, sparsity, sparsity and uh, so on and so forth, but um, mm -hmm. regarding calibration. Yeah, so um, calibration is basically like uh, this way of tuning the temperature of the softmax distribution using a validation set. So I think that uh, no method, uh, Bayesian or not, uh, can obtain a perfect calibration using only the training data, because you would still like somehow overfit on the training data. You still need validation to perform temperature scaling. So uh, I would be very surprised if there would be like a very principled approach that would provide you the perfect temperature uh, during using only the training data. Uh, so empirically, uh, variational inference, like any stochastic neural network would obtain better temperature than any, uh, any deterministic neural network. But well, this is not justified in any way. This is just like an empirical observation, just because an ensemble is more robust than uh, one network and one model. So in principle, you will still need to calibrate the ensemble after training, yeah. So I'm not aware of any works that like, provide some uh, principled reasoning about the calibration. All right, so if the questions are over, so uh, we can take a break and see you on the seminar.